What's up? You got a nice quiet spot? A quiet spot? Oh, kind of. The, as quiet as a regional airport can get. Hey, Mono. Welcome to the uh, Geek Fest here. We're just going to start in just a few minutes. Hi, Oliver's going to make the announcement. Hi, Ruben. Hi. Hi. Hey, Ruben. How are you? Remember, everybody that are watching, you can always send your questions at hashtag GeekFest uh, Berlin on Twitter and also on the website. Schedule page. On of, the schedule page. Yeah, there is a Ask a Creature. Ask a Creature. Is that too loud, actually? Where is the sound coming from? He's at the airport because he's flying oh, out. that's the airport. Okay. And that uh, means he's going to go on first. Weston was at the airport. <laughs> no problem. Is that uh, too much background noise? Uh, and now it's okay. It's okay now. <laughs> okay. So yeah. I'm going to introduce Weston Hecker. He basically uh, is a computer security penetration tester, and he does all kinds of security audits. And he obtained uh, an ATM machine. He purchased it himself legally and uh, discovered that ATM machines have got a single key. One key fits all practically. And you can go into this ATM machine and with a thumb drive, you can plug it into the ATM machine and probably execute a command called give me the loot. And it will spit that out the money. But I'm not. I'm not saying that's really what happened. But I heard it. That's probably what happened. He will go into this in detail. I you think. go into that in detail. Yeah. But on I like the other side, we've got Mono and Ruben. Ruben. Ruben's now ten years old. He's uh, an accomplished Mac app developer and has developed some educational software teaching you how to build secure passwords. And his father, Mono, is right next to him there. And I met him in the Hack in the Box in the Netherlands. And uh, I was really amazed when I saw his program. Yeah, yeah, I was I was there also too. And yeah, that was a really great talk. Uh, he, uh, I remember that you, you gave a talk about the um, uh, cyber security A to Z, uh, an alphabet where you... Uh, yeah, maybe you talk about it. What's about your topic when you're speaking about the, the, the A to Z? Yeah, first of all, let me ask let me Weston how much time he has. He is at an okay. airport. So okay. I, uh, yeah, I have about 45 minutes or probably about an hour, somewhere around there. Okay, I think we should let him go first because he's already at an airport and he's got limited time. Yeah. Ruben, okay with you? Is that okay yeah. with you guys? Good, okay. All right, Weston, awesome. you're on. <laughs> Awesome. Well, uh, well, the actual exploit that I found that was ATM related was actually uh, it was on the new chip and pin cards. So the I basically did a, re a relay attack, and a lot of people have done the relay attacks on point of sale systems. They've never done it on ATM machines. And one of the things is uh, the actual shimmer and skimmer that I built. It basically fits inside the ATM machine, and it actually passes off the credit card information uh, in real time. Because normally uh, there's a request that's made from the device, and you can't just capture and replay that. You have to actually, um, the device that you're cashing out on, you have to actually get that initial request from that machine. So that was one of the things is I actually made a shimmer that impersonates the ATM machine that it's cashing out in. So, And I've done a lot of research with uh, point-of-sale hacking. I also did two talks at Def Gun and Black Hat this year. So, And do you want to know mostly about the actual ATM hack? or? Uh, so, well, just talk a little bit about that, and also talk a little bit about what you talked about at the Hope Conference in respect to the uh, the malware and the uh, ransomware, and how you were able to fool the ransomware people into uh, into releasing the encryption keys. Yeah. Uh, so basically, I wrote some open source software, uh, and it actually what it actually does is it actually blocks uh, ransomware from encrypting computers because a lot of them have sandbox emulate or simulate or uh, Sandbox evasion. So if it's on an actual sandbox, uh, the actual malware will detect it. It won't fully execute it because it believes that it's being reverse engineered. So basically, I made a simulating software that is uh, a sandbox simulator. So it makes your computer, your, your physical computer, look like a virtual computer. And it basically makes it immune to blocky, uh, crypto locker, ransom, uh, 
Crypto Wall, and then uh, Sam Sam. So if there's four variants, uh, actually 28 variants of those four malwares that it makes it immune to. So so that not only does it make your computer immune to it, I also came up with some software that uh, uh, changes your internal file extensions. So if you get hit by malware, it, it, it looks for you know pictures, um, MP3s, movies, things that people would pay ransomware for or would pay the ransom for. And it's something that uh, changes those file extensions daily on your computer so that the actual uh, ransomware is not able to know which files that it's uh, going after because they're all obfuscated file extensions. And that's part of the actual uh, suite of software that I was making. So so between that and then I also came up with some point of sale attacks that uh, used a mag spoofer, which is something that Sammy's Campfire actually created. And it's actually in, able to inject EM or uses an EM field to talk to the magnetic heads on the actual readers and uh, basically injects the credit card information uh, remotely. And that's something where it wasn't possible to do some of the attacks that I did in the past. So it's something where uh, you can inject hundreds of credit card numbers instead of just, you know, having to make one credit card, swipe it, make credit card, swipe it, make credit card, swipe it. So, so are you, are you selling, it. are you selling these malware detectors uh, now through your security company or you making them available for people who want to uh, secure their systems? Um, it's all open source. It's free. It's MIT licensed. So it's all going to be free. I don't like charging people for anything. I think there's um, enough charged software out there. So, and I hope that one of the big AV vendors actually uh, takes software and rip it off. Because I'm, uh, I'm kind of sick of dealing with ransomware, and I'm sure most of people are. Because most of the, you know, hackers or, you know, actual techie people, they end up being the uh, IT supply you know they become the sysadmin for their family and friends so it's something where you'll be able to install this software and it uh, will basically make your friends and family's computers immune to ransomware so so what platforms does it run on um that's made for windows 7 windows 8 and windows 10 and if you try to install it on windows xp it tells you to update your operating system so. <laughs> okay there you go cool <laughs> uh so, do you yeah. want to go ahead and ask uh, Oliver, do you have any other questions for him? Uh, no, I would, <clears throat> I would like to uh, ask Ruben also a, a question so we don't, they don't... Oh, yeah, 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 we want to give him some time too, yeah. of course. Uh, I would like to know, Ruben, how did you first learn about InfoSec and what made you want to go into this field? Okay, so when I was about six or seven, my dad used to train people uh, uh, on cybersecurity and I used to listen into this conversation, and one day when he was on a important business call, he forgot the word firewall, and I he used the word perimeter defenses and stuff like that. Upon coming to that, the call he asked me, "How did you know that?" And so I finally, uh, I told him, "I I can listen to your conversations." So he realized that I had a learning, and he started training me with the testing distro. And then you have started your own company, your game company, right? Yes. Um, yeah, it was it was recruiting games. So what happened was, when I was in second grade, um, uh, I was in a class called Geek and Falcon, and our teacher, Mr. McCombs, asked us, uh, Hey, your project for the year is that you're going to have to make a game. So, our sex has to be educational. So, um, most people took the route of like a board game, like a monopoly or something like that. But I came home and just said, Hey, Tata, I want to make a fun game. And so, him and me took on the adventure and we, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we made our first game called Third. Yeah. Please show a little bit of what was made if that you can show that to you. Yes. Let me actually share the screen mm -hmm. here then. Um, so Ruben will show us his new project he's working on. Oh I think this is actually the old one that was uh, um this is the old one that the first game that he wrote. Do you want us to show the new project that he's working on, or the old one, Oliver? The first game that he wrote. Uh, what what you have prepared? I, I'm, I'm okay. So yeah, let, let let him actually show you. Let him show them the the first game that he wrote, and then okay. Um, okay. 
Objective C. So we're, we're wow, now, we're that's on, hardcore. We are now on the screen of Ruben's computer. Can you go full screen, John? Oh, yeah, hold on. Yeah. Full screen it is, and we're going to get rid of the... Ooh, what happened here? Uh, it's okay. That's oh, okay. Okay, yeah, hold on. That way, this is his screen. That's right, okay. So we are starting the app, I think. Oh, we're doing That's an emulator on. There we go. So well, this is uh, this is Shuriken Map, my first game, and it was made um, for a ninja teacher's you map. So you have these, you have this ninja, and teachers are coming in, and you have these questions, and it's like an anchor. Uh, oh, you failed that game. <laughs> So yeah, answer the questions. If answer the questions back, and there will be a question at the top, like what is three times three? You would see six. six. And um, you have life any and basically if you lost a game, you could get Yeah. That's good. Definitely. You'd um you would say He's trying to answer that question. I would say, if you don't try again, tell us an intro. And that was my first game culture. Great. And you did that in Xcode. I am so impressed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, Xcode is native, native programming language, and that is really amazing. Let's yeah. Go, let's go so let's get back to Western. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, okay, he's, he's switching off screen share here in just a second. No, I'm switching back to yeah, stop sharing screen. Can you see us or do you? Yeah, know? I see you guys now. Go ahead, Weston, your turn. You're on. Good. What do you think of that, man? Xcode in Objective C. Yeah, so you're we're control we're no less. Weston, what do you think of it? Yeah, we were um, planning to rewrite that game into uh, so it could be for Android 2, not just iOS. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, planning to write it in Unity or C Sharp. And uh, Ruben, you know, that's pretty awesome that he's he's that small and he can program in C. I know. I remember I taught myself assembly and uh, C like right when it came out. Uh, how old is he? So that's very impressive. Uh, I'll say Oh wow, yeah. yeah. You're like two years younger than I was, so. Uh, that was pretty <laughs> amazing, impressive. yeah. <laughs> so you mostly program in C++ though, don't you, Weston, now? Oh uh, yeah, anything C-based, pretty much. Oh, pretty uh, much I've, C -based, I've gotten, huh? <laughs> yeah, my tools that I'm writing that make your computers immune to ransomware, I wrote, I had uh, ported over from C code uh, to Visual Basic, and that's only because I want sysadmins to use it. I have no respect for the Visual Basic language. It's just nobody, uh, Every time I write stuff in C++, nobody mods it, so it's something where I want people to be able to modify it, and it also uh, generates PowerShell scripts. So it's something that I, I feel that sysadmins will actually use it. Instead of it being some obscure tool, it'll be something that people can actually modify and make it their own. So. Do you program in Python also? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah pretty much all the scripting languages, like 11 or 12 languages. So, but yeah, I, anything, like I said, anything C-based. So. <laughs> what about you, programmer. Ruben? You program in Python? Uh, yeah, I started Python. Uh, I'm still learning it. Uh, yeah, it's pretty uh, easy to learn. It's uh, it's pretty straightforward language. There's not much to it in the syntax uh, end of things, that's for sure, especially when compared to Objective-C. Yeah. Playing around with the playground is... And Ruben, what uh, other uh, programs or games have you published at Prudent Games? So, um... We published uh, one game called Cracker Proof, which was to um, teach kids how to build strong passwords um, through a fun and uh, interactive way. But since we did that in FC, uh, it was only for iOS and we wanted to publish it in Android, so we're rewriting it now into Android and iOS. Um, what about you, Ruben? Do you program in Java at all, using uh, programming uh, the Android? Yeah, no, not really. We're uh, speaking C-sharp most of the time. So. Yeah, 
And they usually use the Eclipse uh, IDE develop, in, integrated development environment for Android. I've done a little bit of that myself, although I prefer the iPhone myself. I've done some Xcode so, stuff, mostly for the Mac OS, though, not for the uh, iPhone. Mama? Yeah, it's a root start off with, uh, it started off with uh, Xcode in its earlier versions, and it was Objective-C. He then switched a little bit, and we started learning Swift programming language. Oh, yeah. Uh, I was going to ask you about Swift. Uh, have you done anything with Swift? Yeah. So, yeah, that's what he's, like, rewriting some of the games in Swift. But then as we were writing, rewriting the games in Swift, he... We realized that it was still is only going to target the iOS pro, uh, platform. So to target both Android and to use a code once, run anywhere kind of uh, setting, he's learned over summer Unity game, Unity programming. Uh, and so he uses C Sharp actually back end now. So he's learning more of the, you know, what the companies use with the C Sharp as the main programming language using the Unity platform. He'll probably show you, uh, like a map. Game that he's written in Unity, when uh, you know, uh, if you want to see that, so yeah, I do okay, yeah. So, this is one of my um, newer games that we're planning to release uh, by the end of October. It is called, um, it's called Noas. So, make sure you can see the screen. Can you see the screen? Not so far. Let me, uh, let me actually, oh, okay, there you go. Again. Can you see it now? Yes, we do. You can. Okay, so you can talk about what this game is. And so, what this, yeah, talk this game is called NOAS. Basically, no OS, the Open Web Application Security um, Project. So, it is a, uh, it's to teach the OS and risk security um, through a memory card game. So, basically, what works is we tap uh, the play. And I can show you one of the I can show you one of the um, game modes, which is it. And so we go to level one, and we see uh, these different cards. And flip one, it has uh, cross-site scripting, and cross-site scripting is where you inject a script into a uh, into a parameter field. Yeah. Text gets, gets executed. So, um, uh, but they didn't match. So, you see, oh, text executed as a script. That's cross site scripting. So, we go and tap cross site scripting. We see that they disappear. And next is injection flaws. You know, this one is, uh, authentication session. I'm going to try this one. Oh, but that's for. So, now we're going to go back to our injection flaws. And try again, interpret it with me. And finally, tracking group for sweet session and broken authentication session. And then you get a star system. And once you get that, you can move to X. So that's how you play Noah. That's cool. Man. Very so cool. it kind of random, cool. it kind of does, it does a randomization, right? So it's randomly, uh, yes. like selecting them and randomly, randomly putting them up there. So there's, there's no uh, so predictions the or whatever. Yeah, they won't be in the same place. This so one won't be cross-site scripting. It'll be text executed as script. Look, look at the other one. So. Mm -hmm. Open it up. Oh, it's yeah. Yeah. And then as you go through the game, then it kind of makes the game, as you unlock the levels, it makes it more and more difficult. So now we have eight cards, and by the time you add in the, the fifth level, you'll have all the top ten of the attacks. So. So this is when are you planning to release this? Yeah, so uh, like I said, we're planning to release this by the end of October. And this is for cyber awareness yeah. training, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, you... uh, Oliver, so Oliver and John, so this is actually the first time somebody outside has seen this. So Geekfest Berlin is where it's been introduced. Oh, we, we have a, a, a launch here. Thank you for showing yeah. us this. <laughs> yeah, pre cool. preview. Yeah. Oh, a preview. Okay. Preview. Let's yeah. go back and get out of Let's go back, yeah, on the... All right, Weston, i got to ask you a question. I've been asking you. I kind of figured I have wondered about this. That ATM machine you brought it to, you brought to DEF CON, or I think it was Hope, actually. Um, what exact... Uh, how much did you pay for that thing? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> it fell off the truck. No, I know. No, no. <laughs> it must it have taken a problem. a problem getting it in your car, right? 
Oh, yeah. I actually had to rent a Dodge Durango and drive it all the way to Las Vegas from North Dakota. So it was like a 14 and a half hour drive because I couldn't, and I didn't feel safe shipping it because of some of the equipment. I, you know, like I had this uh, fascia put on it where it automatically put the uh, path or it puts the pins in. So it would inject the magnetic or the, the smart card data. So it would actually simulate the card and it would actually automatically enter the pins and then it would collect the cash. So it was a fully automated um, attack on an ATM machine. And the first ATM I bought was about $1,500. And then um, I pulled the random keys off of it for uh, the transaction uh, generation. And I, it, it only cycled through 11 random numbers, which isn't random numbers. It's just 11 numbers, mm. <laughs> which is, uh, I found out later, is the PCI DSS uh, bare minimum. So that's something that uh, whoever converted that uh, first ATM machine did the bare minimum with their conversion package. Oh, so my. it's something that's... So I was like, I'm going to buy another ATM machine because I, I, you know, I, I think the random number generation is broken on that one. So I bought another ATM and it was also broken. <laughs> so a lot of the converted ATM machines, they have um, 11 numbers that they cycle through for, or uh, 11 algorithms that they cycle through for the actual uh, random card generation for the actual one-time CVV numbers and some of the other uh, details that it actually generates on the actual ATM transaction. So Manu. that's one of the... Yeah. Manu, you have yes. a question? I just had a question for Weston. Weston, where do you buy these and how do you buy them? And, uh, you know, is there no validation or tech as to why you are buying them? <laughs> and we can, if, you can, if you can read as to where I'm asked, why I'm asking this. <laughs> I see the future Ruben in your shoes somewhere. And so <laughs> awesome, awesome. Yeah, I know. Actually, you can find them on, like, Craigslist. Type it's like I literally bought mine secondhand. Because uh, some of the first party ones that I looked into, they were sixty thousand dollar ETMs, and they had an NDA with a five year NDA. So, say for example, if I found flaws and vulnerabilities in them, I couldn't have spoke about them for five years. So, right. and that was, yeah, that one kind of that would have ruined uh, the DefCon and Black Hat talk I had this year. So. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I got something that was outside of NDA, and then I just uh, my second ATM I bought I actually converted it myself, and then uh, to EMV. So, uh, so. If you're paying MasterCard Visa, it's the new chip and pin cards. So they're, they used to be not susceptible to actually people attacking them, and this is an actual relay attack. So like when you put a shimmer inside of a point-of-sale system, people actually collect all those electrical impulses and then impersonate the ATM machine that people are cashing out on. And I actually made an entire blockchain that is a distribution system for the actual stolen credit card data. As a sim like, you know, it's, it's a pretty cool... Uh, environment and you have like a one minute block or a window where you get a connection to a dmvpn and then uh when you actually sign up for the uh you know this is all playing the devil's advocate and the bad guy site i'm one of the good security researchers obviously i'm not a bad guy but it's something where uh this, this site you actually purchase basically instead of purchasing credit card numbers because they're not static like how the how you can now you can go to carter sites and buy a credit card for four and a half dollars uh this one you're actually purchasing uh time on an actual on network. So it's basically, yeah, it's kind of a simulated uh, how I think the bad guys are going to go once the actual mag strips end, which, uh, like, I'm going over to the Netherlands. Uh, it, like, that's actually where I'm flying to. I uh, to talked to Hardware I.O. It's uh, awesome. I'm going to go over the actual skimmers and shimmers and how um, I actually, you know, built some of the utilities that I used in some of the attacks, in addition to some of the fun Arduino stuff. Because I had uh, three Arduinos plugged into a Raspberry Pi, and they would accept the PIN number, and then instead of flashing lights, they would actually turn a servo motor and they would automatically enter the pins. But then the actual skimmers and shimmers I made, uh, I actually uh, built a DSP or a digital signal processor. And uh, so it actually can uh, demodulate and remodulate the actual electrical impulses into something that's readable by machine. Wow. Uh, okay, here you are. You're driving from your office. In what state was it where you're from again? Uh, North Dakota. North Dakota. Here you are. You're driving your, your SUV in North Dakota. With what? How many? Two ATM machines in your car? In your SUV? I just brought one with me. You uh, brought one. one yeah, well, has anybody ever there. like looked in the yeah. window of the car and like at a gas station or something and thought, "Whoa, what's going on here?" <laughs> yep, yep. Because I had a box with fifty thousand dollars and fake fake hundreds too. So, and so, I thought I did my demonstration on stage. Somebody like actually ran off with some of the money. <laughs> have you ever <laughs> like pulled over by a cop with the ATM machines, have a figure stolen it or something? <laughs> yeah, that's one of my biggest worries. That's why I drove like uh, eighty the whole way there. So, because I was like, I'm gonna get pulled over in like somewhere before Nevada, and you know, somebody's gonna wonder why I have an ATM machine and a bunch of point of sale systems in my SUV. So, <laughs> so that was one of the things. And all my uh, fraud fraud devices, like the shimmers and the skimmers. 
I didn't actually put the firmware on them until I got to my hotel, just in case if my vehicle would have gotten stolen or something like that. I just didn't want the hardware falling into the wrong hands. So, so you did that like more as a security thing then, right? Yep, yep. And uh, when it powers off uh, for 15 seconds, the CMOS battery, it'll actually wipe, uh, wipe the information off of it. It'll, uh, yeah, because it's flash memory, so it won't stay resident anymore. So, yeah, because I know there were some guys that were doing a DEF CON talk, I think it was like two years ago. And they accidentally left like some software defined radio and a bunch of like software that was pretty bad uh, on the actual plane. So yeah, that was pretty pretty crazy. And if that would have fallen in the wrong hands, luckily uh, Delta employees, I believe, was picked it up and you know turned it in. But they were wondering, you know, what what that device was. So that's I didn't want the same kind of situation happening. So so uh, um, Ruben, I want to ask you a question here. Uh, Okay, you get this idea for this application program you're going to write, and you're not really, you're not, you, you kind of get the visualization of what kind of little objects you're going to be moving around on the screen and stuff. Do you like draw this out artwork wise first and kind of like, uh, um, kind of do the artwork and then add the artwork to the program itself? Or do you sort of like uh, emulate it somehow and then, and then, uh, write the actual code that makes the stuff work? Uh, and how long does it usually take you to write a program like that? Um, so I just, um, like you said, I usually like, try to draw it out or picture it in my mind and then try to put it into the game and figure out what best a kid would like or uh, a kid like me or, uh, would embrace. And it usually takes me about maybe um, a month or two. To be a full-fledged app. actually and implement it into, in, into Objective-C. Okay. Uh, and uh, do you, uh, let's see. I um, can't remember what I was going to say. Um, after, after you got it implemented and after you got it working out, how long does it usually take you to debug the program? Or does, and how do you debug it? Do you actually use the, uh, the source level debugger inside the uh, Objective-C and you do things like uh, performance testing it and uh, and things like that too to to catch the uh, to catch the uh, floating handles that sometimes you forget to deallocate. <laughs> so yeah, it's interesting. You so most of the stuff that he learns from the syntax standpoint is when he makes mistakes when the compiler starts to you know starts to complain. Then uh, I would first help him. In like figuring out how he needs to go identify the line of code where the error is coming from. But now he's starting to get better and better and like fixing it himself. Uh, but I actually tell him sometimes, like we tell him to make mistakes intentionally to see how the code actually would fail. That way he knows how to fix it if it errors. Uh, regarding performance testing, it's actually mostly his kids, uh, friends that come and play on the, when he puts it in their iPhones or so, and they basically give him all the feedback. There's no like, uh, like corporate level, enterprise level kind of performance testing or anything. Uh, in fact, even some of the, uh, the game that he showed you, the Novas, we know of a bug that is in the game, uh, and we actually want to see if the user community will catch that bug. You know, because, so we're going to release it with the bug in the kit and uh, see because for two reasons. One, we haven't figured out how to fix the bug ourselves. <laughs> so uh, how much time do you spend chasing down compiler errors? Or do you actually sort of take advantage of the uh, of the? Do you take advantage of the code completion uh, features in Xcode, which is very nice. I I've had a little experience with that myself, and uh, and I, I have a trouble remembering all those zillions and zillions of API calls and in in Objective C and those objects and methods and all that. Now, so I was wondering whether you take advantage of that a lot, and does it helps that I guess it helps a lot in chasing down your compiler problems, huh? Yeah, it, yeah. It, yeah, for the most part, yes. Like we, you know, we take the suggestions based on what the, you know, what the, the ID itself would tell you, like fix it, you know, fix it by this uh, syntax or so. But then we can also be able to look at like, Stack Overflow. And yeah, we look at different websites like Stack Overflow or um, just on different websites and see what the correct code is or how to fix it. And yeah. Yeah, Exco does a very good job of uh, of helping the programmer write code for that thing. I have to admit, uh, every time I see Xcode, I'm just blown away by all of the extra little features it has in there, and I kind of kick myself in the butt for not getting back into it again. But uh, I have a terrible time with uh, compiler errors myself. 
What about you, Weston? Do you have problems with C++ compiler errors also? Uh, only when I'm tired. So. Only when you're tired. <laughs> I'm just joking. That's I have, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, when I don't go a couple of months without programming, um, yeah, it's hard to pick it back up and I'll be more prone to errors, but I kind of get in this zone where I kind of shut off my social part of my brain and I can just get in computer mode. Do you list, like listen and, to yeah. listen to music when you program? Yep, I listen to the hardest techno I can find. Well, we listen to techno? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, uh, yeah, just yeah, something that's repetitious, it doesn't have words. So. Yeah, side trance is my favorite. What about you, Ruben? You like to listen to music when you program? Um, a little bit, I guess. Yeah. What kind of music do you like listening to when you program? Yeah, he doesn't listen to music when he programs generally, but uh, what is he? Uh, he kind of gets into the zone and then tries to figure things out and then. You know, he's usually at that mode when his brother or I or anyone else can't disturb him, and then we'll we'll go in, you know, yeah, like and we'll be like, I need to fix this, or I have to figure this out, and then he'll spend one side. I can tell you of a time when, till one o'clock in the night, there was a it was an error on, it was actually a logic error in his code, and you know, he didn't uh, figure that out till about one o'clock because syntactically it was all it was all compiling fine, and then at close to one, and you may be wondering, what's the 10-year-old kid doing at one in the night? And he would refuse to go to sleep. He wouldn't go to sleep even though he had school the next day. Uh, and when he figured it out, it was like, you know, he experienced what most programmers, like, you know, most season programmers like us say, over years have experienced, which is like, I got it finally. So, so how late at night do you stay up when you try to get the, try to get the program working? You, do you work all night till you get the bug fixed and, and then call it quits? Or do you kind of like say, well, I think I'm going to... I'm going to work on this and think it over and sleep it on, sleep on it tonight and work on it tomorrow. Yeah, pretty much sleep on it tonight and work on it tomorrow. That's because his mom won't let him stay up all night. So, if you what let about him you, Weston? How do you feel? Uh, how late do you stay up at night programming? Oh, yeah, pretty much the same. Uh, I think something around, I used to be able to program, you know, two or three in the morning, but I'd say in time around 11 on, especially if I've been programming all day. Anything over nine or ten hours, it just it becomes counterproductive. So yeah, as of late, usually like the last two years, I don't program anything after six o'clock. Because if I do, I I don't sleep the next day. I stay awake all night and I can't sleep. Yep. I'm, I'm the same way. I can't like, give it up. Works. If <laughs> then I sleep. Yeah. If there's, yeah. If there's something that's blocking, or if there's some kind of bug I'm chasing, it's something that yeah. I'm the same way. I can't go to sleep till I figure it out. And, and if I do try to go to sleep, I'll sit and think about it in bed. So I might as well be, you know, still working at it. So, the, uh, what the development language, uh, what development environment do you uh, program in, Weston? Do you program in, in uh, does you program on the Mac? Or do you program in Windows or uh, C plus uh, plus? What is it? Uh, is it using like uh, what is it? Uh, uh, Visual Visual C Studio or something like that? And you use the source level debugger and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I'm not a fan of Microsoft. I have nothing against them in general, but it's just, yeah, they they do make, like, their current product line is pretty good, and, yeah, I'm sorry. Like, I used to be a huge open source fan and stuff like that, and, but, yeah, I've, I've gone to, because I, I, I don't program for a living anymore, so, uh, so it's something where I don't, you know, have very, very long days of programming, so it's something where I go for, for some of the more professional versions, especially with some of the volume licensing my last few employers have had, so, yeah, it's so, just something... I can program in any environment, but it's, yeah, I prefer the Microsoft products over some of the more recent ones, especially for some of the C language stuff. So. Go ahead, Ruben. Oh, yeah. My favorite um, environment for programming is my bedroom. I sit in bed and just program. <laughs> <laughs> sit in bed what? Sit in bed. It's the, the, I, the, yeah, the <laughs> famous, his, his favorite uh, programming environment. Okay, yeah. Bed. Sit in bed programming, huh? Uh, Ruben, you uh, founded uh, CyberShaolin.org, right? Uh, yes. Can you tell us why you yeah, founded it? Yeah, so CyberShaolin is a nonprofit organization um, which tries to educate, equip, and empower kids and adults with cybersecurity knowledge uh, of dangers and defenses. Just like in Kung Fu, you would learn about kicks and punches, which are like attacks. Uh, and blocks and uh, stances, which are defenses. You'll learn, uh, you'll learn about different attacks and defenses uh, in Cyber Shaolin through short videos and games, etc. Um, yeah. So, so the, the idea is to eat. So, Ruben, also, I don't know if uh, 
the hearers, the audience here knows, uh, Ruben also is uh, America's youngest child to to black belt. Um, so when he was eight, seven years old, he earned first degree black belt. And uh, when he was nine, he tested second degree. And uh, so he, he just trained to, uh, and so this sacred out the sacrificial part and shawl and to blend them together so you could like attacks and defenses like to learn in Kung Fu. Uh, the same concept for like, doing digital Kung Fu, right? Yeah. So, so it's like it's like Kung Fu and martial arts. And so the idea came as uh, uh, when we were thinking about to educate the kids. Uh, and the story actually comes, uh, it goes back to one Christmas. And uh, just before Christmas, I was going to swim school uh, for a swim class. And the uh, uh, and he asked me if I bought something for, him, um, uh, for Christmas. And I'm the last minute shop, so I have not bought anything for him for Christmas. So I asked him if he wanted anything. And he responded by saying, uh, uh, no, I don't want anything. I have everything I need. Uh, and so first I thought it was like a good trip. He was, you know, like he wanted to go get some. I knew he wanted to get Disney Infinity Skylander party. So I was going to buy that for him, but I had bought it yet. Uh, so when we came home, I, when I was uh, asking like, what he wanted to do then, and my wife and I asked him, uh, you know, we were impressed with your re- response about not wanting a Christmas gift, but what did you really want to do? And he said, he wanted other kids to kind of know what he knows. So, and immediately my wife and I were like, um, how are you going to do, you know, thinking about, uh, thinking about, uh, the cost and everything that I would enter. And, uh, and he said, uh, uh, and he said, uh, I would actually want to make videos and put it, up, uh, make games and put it up. And that's how Cyber Shaolin was on. John, go ahead. So how do you allocate your time? with school and programming, let's say on a school night, okay? You, I, I assume you go to school, or I don't know, maybe you're homeschooled, yeah. I don't know. Thank you. But uh, you probably go to school right. around 9 o'clock and then probably get off at 3 like most people do. So is that when you start coding? Is it 3 o'clock in the afternoon after you get home from school, or do you do your homework first and then start coding afterwards? What's your schedule like? Yeah, so I, most of the time I do my homework at school itself. So. Ah, okay. And then... And then I okay, come so home. here you are. Here yeah. you are. You're in class, and you're learning whatever you're learning in school. And do you sort of like uh, take a few notes about coding while you're while you're you know learning in school, or <laughs> the teacher's teaching um, you? I think there has been times where I ponder over it, but like maybe not take notes. But I've always thought about uh, maybe thought about programming sometimes at school. How much support do you get from your your teacher at school uh, on your coding uh, efforts? Um, so how much support do you get on your talk coding? Um, you want, oh, okay. so, so yeah, in so computer class. In computer class, we um we're learning uh, Scratch, which is the drag and drop lock uh coding, which is uh. And so you're in fifth grade. Yeah. I'm not even going to ask you what grades you're getting, as if I don't already know. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing okay on grades. He somehow manages to. To be a straight A student, we, we, that, that baffles us at times. But uh, but he's doing okay, and he's, he's got tremendous support from the school. He goes to the Harmony School of Science in Austin, and uh, tremendous support from the administration, and the teachers, uh, the school itself. He's in fifth grade. The, school, the computer classes, the teacher that has identified, uh, Mr. Torby has identified that uh, he needs more uh, challenging problems than just the scratch that they're introducing. So. So they give him some attention and then works with teachers on what needs to be done. So in the computer class, at least, yeah. And do you mix in sports along with uh, what you do in school as programming? Yes, and so What's your favorite sport? Uh, probably Kung Fu. But other than Kung Fu, I do gymnastics, hockey, swimming, piano, drums, and... Uh, <laughs> yeah, so in sports, he's actually very athletically gifted as well. And he was like the state champion in the rings in 2014. Uh, gymnastics is one of his passions. He trains about four or five hours sometimes a day. You should try uh, to become in, a ninja uh, warrior or something. You know, <laughs> next, uh, is yeah. DerbyCon, but we're not able to make it to DerbyCon because he's selected to go to the regional Future Stars gymnastics competition, which is next week. So we just came from a, for a two, hour, two and a half hour session, gymnastics training for this, uh, 
for this <laughs> video, this conference. Sounds like you have a pretty yeah, heavy yeah. schedule there. Yeah, thank you for taking your time, Ruben. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Uh, Weston, let's see what I have for you here. Um, earlier, uh, what about how do, you pro how do you spend your time in programming? Like when you get up in the morning, do you, do you think about programming or, or do you do your kind of business kind of stuff and then kind of later in the afternoon start coding or do you code like in the afternoon or evenings or stuff like that? Um, yeah, usually um, if I'm going to be coding that day, I have to dedicate an entire day to it. So it's something where I use it a majority after my actual work day. And I've been doing a lot more reverse engineering than actual coding of the last few years. So. Oh, yeah, that, so. that reverse engineering, yeah, that must, that must be a, <clears throat> quite of a challenge. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I did a little bit of that myself, and, boy, it's, uh, it can be messy. Yeah, it's pretty mentally draining. Anything in low level, like assembly level stuff, is, and is very what? taxing. Weston, you uh, worked for the security of the emergency system uh, in in the U.S. for the uh, 911 number, I think it's called. Yeah, um, it's a contract that we have through University of Houston, and it's actually DHS uh, and DARPA, and it's an actual 911 attack mitigation. So I did a TDOS telephone denial of service talk at DEF CON two years ago now, and it got the got the attention of uh, DARPA and DHS because one of the simulations was um, how you could take down the entire peace apps in an entire state with five prepaid cell phones. So, so those phones were able to make 70 calls a minute per cell phone. So five of them, you know, do the math on it. It was pretty heavy duty call volume and it actually uh, tied up all the SIP and PRI lines for the actual phone provider. So it was, uh, it was like the concept was a burner phone DDoS and it was one of these $2 a day unlimited calling plants and you could generate 70 calls a minute. And it hopped to the PRL list, the preferred roaming list of the, the towers and everything like that. So does it was use, uh, pretty cool. It's pretty fun to S do. And, does it use SS7 and all that stuff? Um, yeah, it depends on for some of the, uh, depending which GIS database and stuff, there's some uh, communication back and forth with some of the information, I guess. I'm, yeah, and with a lot of uh, cell phone providers, they have to use a lot of those systems that are in place, some of the back-end systems. So, so. Ruben, you have something yeah, they, to add? Yeah, um, Weston, what would you advise for me that wants to get into, a kid like me that wants to get into reverse engineering, how would I get started, or uh, what do I do? Um, personally, um, like, I didn't have the internet when I was your age. <laughs> I don't mean to sound like an old guy, but, no, I had to, I actually went to school and I'd print off, like, hundreds of lines of code, and I would just read it until I'd confuse myself. And I like to start in Midias Reese, like, in the middle of the code, and just dive as deep as I can and confuse myself. Because when you try to go back to some of the easy stuff, uh, it just becomes naturally, especially I think me and you have the kind of same mindset. So you just confuse yourself as much as you can, and then the other stuff behind that comes naturally. And that's, yeah. and that's one of the biggest things. And if you want to get into assembly or if you're looking for x86, I would just recommend uh, getting into some low, very low-level format. And then if you program in C, you know, you can always have it open so you can view everything in assembly. It's not the exact same, but if you want to start getting a taste of some of the low-level uh, controls and stuff like that, it would be a very good a step and that's the way that I did it. I, I literally just learned by reading other people's code because I, I didn't take a programming class until because I live in North Dakota, so they didn't even offer it. And if it was, it was VB. So and you guys know how much I like VB. So I can <laughs> so remember. <laughs> I can remember when I was coding Easy Writer. Uh, I had to go to jail at night, and I took the listing at home with me, and and uh, I had it was an ideal programming environment because I had a chance to get away from the computer so I can get my thoughts processes better and I could look at the fourth commands and look at and visualize what the stack is after each little call it made and I can kind of write it, scribble it down on, on the listing. It was an ideal programming environment and I could get, I got easy writer done in three months. I never could have done it that quickly if I'd have done it any other way. But you don't yeah, promote, I, I, you don't No, promote I don't promote this don't kind promote. of programming activity, by the way. No, 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 you don't. Uh, I started rolling down the path of learning to program like main level languages and then as he's learning more, I think I'll slowly introduce him to assembly, like you said, uh, Western. And, uh, you know, but I don't want it to be too cryptic for him now. I think once he understands how to take a small program and look at it in an assembler or disassembler, then he'd be able to. Maybe we should do that uh, next when we have some. But uh, we we didn't uh, came to the point um, about your talk that you actually uh, or I witnesses the the uh, A B set A to set in cybersecurity.
That was a very interesting talk. Can you talk about the concept of this speech? Yeah, so um, cybersecurity alphabets is basically all the way from ARP spoofing A to zero day attacks uh, Z. And um, we would went, go through like buffer overflow and explain how a kid would learn it in a simpler type of format. Um, you want to show? Oh, like you want to show the example? Yeah, so we're going to show you an example. Like we have the, we're going to pull out the top. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah, Weston, um, what is your time schedule doing? It looks like I depart in 45 minutes, so I'll start boarding here in about, I'd say, half an hour. Okay. Are you on the other Before side of security? Yeah, I'm on the other side of security. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so can you see? We can see. Speaking loudly about hacking stuff in the okay, yeah, don't secure side too. of an airport. So. <laughs> don't fly <laughs> sideways. Can you guys see the screen now? Yeah, I see it. Okay, so okay. I can just quickly go over maybe one or two of those. And... Yeah, so um, cybersecurity alphabets, it is a, um, what are alphabets? Alphabets, they're basic building blocks, kids learn as their foundation. So um, I can show you a few uh, authentication. Uh, so we got the idea, uh, or buffer overflow. Yeah. So, um, um, what would happen is there would be a party and you had an invitation to the party. But a, um, a robber, uh, changed the party and it has been moved to a different location. And when you got to the, uh, place or the house where the robber was keeping the party, it would be, uh, it would be, uh, they, he would rob you. Yeah. So it's like or here's another one you can talk about not itself. <laughs> like this is how a kid would understand it not observe. It's like Spider Man is planning to go down, but then Thor puts his hammer out there, right? So <laughs> and, and so yeah, you are, so. for for every letter you have one uh, um, yeah description of a of a uh, vulnerability yeah. or what people should be aware of in cybersecurity. And you are going down the list and the list and the list. We were sitting there and the, in the audience, I think there were 500 professionals. And I think everyone learned a little bit. It was because you are, you are not only uh, explaining it in the technical way, you are then explain it to like you would explain it to a friend that is not technical. So, uh, yeah. yeah, how you how you, do you uh, describe describe it to a friend? So I, I really love the, the 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 concept of that. Thank you. Was this was this your idea, Ruben? Um, yeah, a little bit. Um, I really wanted to do a talk, and we uh, like Cyber Shallon, how we would make short sure videos and games about different topics like this, I thought this would be a great way to embrace that and start off. Like, so all the way from A, and I really wanted to uh, teach others how easy it is to uh, for different security controls and checks. Got a question what for you, Ruben. What does your t-shirt say? Oh, so what does your t-shirt say? Oh, the t-shirt says Cyber Shaolin. Cyber. Cyber Shaolin. Okay. I know yeah. what uh, 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 everyone uh, should have a look to this web page, and uh, uh, the, the, you can uh, participate and help uh, Ruben in uh, building up uh, Cyber Shaolin. And it's a very great place. And yeah, just everyone should have a look on this. Uh, even uh, yeah, the the infosec uh, crew help, helps you a lot, I think, but. You can yeah. always have more helping hands, I think, right? And uh, yeah, Weston, for you, are you on yeah. Wi-Fi or are you on the uh, cell here? So oh, I'm on the. Oh, I took a risk. I'm on uh, airport wireless. So. Oh, okay. I kind of figured you were it's a VM with a dongle, so or, or yeah. revert a snapshot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so Cyber Shaolin is a nonprofit uh, here, so. Um, which means anybody who wants to help us can join join forces with us. So it's an open call to anyone who wants to participate and help with all of the efforts. But like what um, you mentioned, 
like what you mentioned, uh, Oliver, we can always take any help that is given to us. So, so that, that'd be an open call for help. And how can the people help uh, to make it bigger? Right. Uh, so, yeah, there is a there is a page if you go to the top, they're not sharing the screen. So, yeah. um, so, so the, the ones that they could do is uh, actually Ruben's pulling up a screen over here. If go uh, to uh, uh, conversations and share screen, start, and you should be seen. yeah. Yes. So, so can kill the time. We need especially a graphic design, you know, website design and animation. Um, there is also you could also become a sponsor. Kat Kaspersky Labs came over to couple first ones for cyber travel and and uh, they sent a explanation as thousand followers. Uh, yeah. That the companies that are involved were in sponsoring, um, and we basically use that to help in creating more videos and whole games uh, you know, that Ruben's building and and getting that message across. But there is a page called shopping slash or org get dash in that will have more information that they can go and uh, become partners with us. Great. Let's let's hope for more help. I got a yep. question for you, Weston. What is the nastiest attack vector you're working on these days? I mean a really nasty one, other than of course the SS seven, but we already know what that is. Yeah. Um, one of the more recent, I'm working on a remote code execution on a kind of firewall deal. Um, there's some kind of attack surface that opens up when it's over a certain amount of CPU utilization. It doesn't clean its code up properly. That's one of the nastiest ones. But other than that, uh, I've been working on um, heuristics injection for actually stealing SAMS files or like uh, off of domain controllers and stuff like that to pull them to local machines. So, and uh, there was a couple. I'll be do, possibly doing a talk at it later. I have a, a myself and another guy are doing the research on it. So, but it's yeah, it's basically being able to steal the where all the passwords are saved on a Windows machine by using the uh, trusted antivirus software. So, so, are you giving a talk in the Netherlands? Is that why you're on your way there? <laughs> yeah, I, I just, uh, um, uh, some of the shimmers and skimmers that I built for actually uh, like stealing your credit card information and just some of the uh, digital signal processors and extra. Hardware, like some of the miniaturization stuff that I made, I'm going to actually be uh, going over how some of it works and just how to protect yourself, how to protect some of the machines. Because um, some of the responsible disclosure times weren't actually at the mark, the mark that we wanted. So I couldn't go into some details about how some of the attacks worked. Because it's something we didn't want the bad guys using in a while. So it's something where I'm going to go, this is a hardware version of the actual attack service. So it's going to go really, really in-depth. Uh, for Black Hat and DEF CON, I, I kept it a little more high level where everybody could kind of understand it because not everybody's read all 1,438 pages of the EMV manuals. There's a lot that you have to actually read <laughs> to actually understand a lot of it. So, And then I, I don't have an electrical engineering background. I was computer science and uh, geophysics. What event did you, but it's something where, yeah. What, did, so what, event, did you say, kinda, what event did you say you up? were speaking at? Oh, it's Hardware I.O. Oh, it's Hardware I.O. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. That's a good good convention. I'll, I'll be excited to do there. There should be a bunch of interesting people there. So <laughs> I always like uh, security conferences outside the United States. So you can get some pretty interesting interactions. So. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, Mano. Hey, Weston. I'm not yes. sure if you can see this book or not, but it's actually called awesome. Getting Started in Electronics. Awesome. I, I'm, you know, I didn't write it or anything, but it's a fantastic book by uh, Forrest Mims. And it's one where... Uh, you know, the way I, Ruben's reading this, and the thing that's really cool about it is it's all handwritten. Oh, uh, right. You know, it's still too basic for you, I think, but if, if you said since you didn't have a background in electrical engineering, we don't have either, and so to get uh, exposed to, like, electronics, and so on, this, is a, this is a fantastic read, so anybody who's interested should oh, yeah. probably take a look at it. So I guess you can get it in, like, Radio Shack or something, but uh, the book is. Awesome. Yeah, yeah I'll definitely check it out. Yeah. I've read a couple uh, college level books because I did some introductory classes in college and stuff. But yeah, I did some uh, college reading, and then a lot of the uh, I got a lot. I got pretty heavily into software defined radios lately, and uh, I got a couple Edison two tens, which are really really sweet radios. You can they have very high sample rates, and uh, I was doing some actual attacks on passive key entry systems for cars. So uh, do you guys hear about the amplification attack in two thousand nine? There's some guys from Sweden. 
and they actually uh, are, yeah, so the passive key entry stuff. So I actually built a DSP that breaks that signal down from layer one to layer two, and then you can break it down to, down to layer one and turn it back into radio waves. So it's something yeah, where I, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool to have, so. I'll, I'll actually, if you don't mind, I'll connect uh, with you outside the context of this conference because of the limitation of time to talk yeah. to you a little bit about, about that. So. Yeah, Sweet. yeah well, no, definitely. We, if you we, want to get them in the radio. We have really some, really some questions here. Uh, out of the, uh, from the net, and this is uh, from Lisa Loop. Um, she was one of our speakers yesterday, and I told her that she should meet uh, Ruben indirectly, so she can ask us a few questions. Maybe she gets in contact with you direct. We will see. Uh, she asks, uh, "How do we encourage more techy activity for the greater good?" more techy activity. Like techy activity. Um, what would you um, encourage? Um, um, I think they could uh, start it with Raspberry Pi to so already made us. Okay. Start um, trying to build uh, getting started in electronics, like I said. Uh, do you have anything to add? Yeah. Yeah, technology. Oh, okay. So, like, getting started with Scratch program. And there's another question. Lots of kids are using Scratch. How does its power compare with these other languages, code languages? Um, so, Scratch is more of a uh, logic-based program that helps for drag and drop. So, you don't have to type in all the syntax. Yeah, it mainly teaches you the logic. So, I think Scratch and... Uh, it's a good starting point because it teaches you the logic of coding and doesn't just make you run off. I've never even heard of Scratch. You never? No. Oh, you have to learn something new. Gee, I'm an old school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and are there any online teaching resources you suggest newbies should use? Um, YouTube videos, go to the Cyber Shaolin website. I think that would help too. <laughs> yeah, um, Cyber Shaolin. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, definitely uh, take advantage of YouTube videos when I learn how a, how a program works for sure, or how to use a program. I always go to YouTube first when I look for it there, and I usually find what I'm looking for. Um, Weston, I have a question for you. Uh, have you been any have you, have you done any work yet on MSI catchers? Um, you know, things like that. Um, this seems to be sort of like uh, uh, the in thing these days on mobile telephones. Yeah. Um, I use it a lot for my work. We do a lot of IoT research. Um, I actually have an Edison 210, which is like a software demand radio once again, but I turned it into a cellular base station, and it's all operated inside of a, I have a Faraday cage in my office. So I have like a 325 square foot office, and my server room is a Faraday cage. So you have your own, it's pretty you nice. Have, you have your own Faraday cage? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> nice. Oh. Yeah, I get all I get all the fun toys since uh, it was one of my buddies had it in his garage, and he brought it over to my office. Uh, the actual hardest part was getting the ground uh, ground field working and then getting the actual ground so it wouldn't send the cellular tower uh, or the cellular information uh, lower or higher. Because it, it was a pretty cool cage. It was actually originally built for a garage. And just how the meshing was, it was, a, it was a pretty cool setup. And like I'm saying, I'm able to actually do um, a lot of cool testing. Like I can do some XOR attacks on uh, actual uh, cellular networks. Uh, I can do low, low availability stuff. So you can literally... Um, and the Edison, the N210s, you can usually do per, a pretty good amount of subscribers. It's about a $2,700 radio, so you can uh, you can do a lot more than you can with like some of the cheaper three or four hundred dollar radios, or even some of the seven hundred dollar entry level Edison ones. So yeah, it's basically you can do some cell site impersonation, and uh, there's some other attacks that I came across. Uh, one of them was like uh, if you spin up an Egyptian cell phone tower, it, it's like an older. Uh, so basically, you, you broadcast a beacon that you're an Egyptian cell phone tower, and the baseband software in 2009 or older phones will actually turn the GPS off on a handset. And it's like, there's lots of, like, little uh, vulnerabilities that you can come across just, you know, uh, poking around and just seeing what happens. That's why I think, like, that when I felt like, what makes me feel like an 11-year-old nowadays, like, really excited was when I got back into uh, software find radios, and I recommend it for everybody who's uh, looking for something as a really good hobby, a really cheap hobby. So, like, as you can get entry level software defined radios, you can get PAL, PAL tuners for about twenty eight dollars. They're not really software defined radios, but uh, you can start, you know, sniffing out what's in your area and start uh, listening to it. So, yeah, 
Uh, Weston was, not, I'm sorry, uh, Karsten was uh, talking a little bit about that earlier today, um, about uh, the uh, inside catchers, and he's got a, an application program. Uh, um, it's, it's, it's source, it's available, but it's for the Android, and it's supposed to, it's Snoop something, I forget what it was called, Snoop. Spoof Snoop? Yeah, something like that, and it's for the Android, and uh, so when you're... Uh, Using your Android phone and anywhere where there's uh, some of these MSI catchers, it will let you know, which is really cool. Now, does any one of you, or uh, do you have uh, software on your on your mobile devices that, uh, you, yeah, you do you use for privacy issues, Weston? Oh no, I have a uh, I have a couple of developers handsets that I can. Uh, like when we go to DEF CON, we lock our PRL list, our preferred roaming list, so we won't connect to fake towers. So, like, we have somebody who gets there, like, a day or two before Black Hat, and we'll actually log the uh, towers that are in the area and what's responding. And a lot of that's lower or baseband software. Like, if you have your uh, iOS or whatever your operating system is, then underneath that's a baseband software. That's what connects to the actual cell towers, and that's something where you can't really interact with that, except for on special handsets, which are developer-unlocked handsets. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, Apple's locked down much, much more than Android, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. Yep. I would 100% agree with that. Yeah, they, they, they used to be, you know, totally closed source. They wouldn't even use i7 processors several years ago. So. I can remember right when the iPhone first came out, somebody anonymously emailed me a um, some APIs, which were not released by Apple, for the AT&T uh, baseband stuff. And uh, it was quite fascinating, but I never used it. Uh, but I can imagine what you can do with it. <laughs> what about you, Ruben? What, what kind of security programs do you use? Do you use, like, WhatsApp or Signal or, or Wicker or stuff like that? Um, no, just basically, I mean, in terms of, like, security programs as such, he's not fully into it at all. So we don't generally use other than standard conventional, so, you know, virus and malware protection uh, the Mac, all the, all the systems on Mac, uh, even though we have Mac being vulnerable to attacks, uh, for, for the most part, we haven't been targeted or attacked much. But, but we do general general hygiene of don't connect to public wireless, um, you know, uh, as much as possible. Always have your own dedicated line, uh, VPN in if you need to for sensitive data, those kinds of things. So Airport uh, Wi-Fi, don't connect to Airport. <laughs> I, I remember the the talk at uh, Ag in the Box last year, Ruben, uh, where you gave your ABC uh, A2Z. Uh, but then, then the last fifteen minutes of your talk, you were doing life hacking. And um, yeah. do you remember what you have accomplished there? Um, what was for Hack in the Box? Hack in the box. Oh, Andrew. Android. Yeah, so um, tell us about it. The hack for the uh, <clears throat> last part of the demo or last part of the talk was I created a malicious app uh, and uh, basically imported it into an Android bot, Android device and got complete access and shell to it. So you created the malware. Created the malware. Yeah, had somebody install it, uh, and the malware basically had a. Uh, <clears throat> A tunnel, a reverse tunnel back to my uh, box, and we basically made it a uh, metaprinter show, yeah, a tunnel of metaprinter show, and basically connected back to mine, and I um, had full show. Full show access, but what did you do? Oh, <laughs> and I turned on the camera, and basically, uh, did I key log? No, I didn't. I don't know if you key log, but you turned on the camera, and I think Oliver was in one of the pictures when we I'll, took I'll I'll out. Audio as well. Audio as well, so you could hear the sound of the uh, uh, hacked machine, and you could uh, use the video uh, like you wanted. And yeah, uh, also you hacked the email address, the email password of the host Dylan. of this whole show oh. within five minutes. And really, uh, yeah, the people in the audience were really stunned, <laughs> I would say. And yeah, at, the, at the end, you, you closed up with, uh, if I can do it, anyone can do it. I really yeah. like that. Uh, it was really, yeah, it made it clear that uh, not only the, 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 the hackers that we know with the caps and, uh, uh, yeah, this, this movie figures are the dangerous ones. Uh, it could be also Giles. 
Right, right. Yeah. So, so, uh, so, so the, the point is with uh, Ruben in all of his talks, he at the very end always make Eric as a live demo. And even if he feels he's fine with that, I, many others, I hope uh, all other speakers take that as well. Okay, I'll demo the fail. Uh, you know, so, but he tries it. And then, fortunately, he's had success, you know, with successful, except for maybe one or two instances. Uh, uh, where we had some conflicts, but uh, you know it's good for me to be in the confidence. And but I think what the demo really shows is it's not just about talking the talk, but also people visualize and seeing that if I can really do some of these attacks, then you know, uh, the world is really something that needs to be attention for from a cybersecurity standpoint. And it eye opens, it opens the eyes of many uh, yourself and others, right? Of course. So I think that. When I, generation that we are seeing, like, it's just as cutting in this whole upcoming generation that we see, especially the technology and the information that, uh, we need to do what it's right, right to prepare them so that it is, uh, they enter a world that's much safe and secure online. So, uh, Ruben, uh, do you have any advice for young hackers or kids that are yeah. going into yeah. coding? Um, first of all, I would say, um, firstly, I think if this is the right thing, would I get into any trouble without that permission? In other words, think about the ethics of this. Um, uh, second, I think that, um, take things step by step. Don't rush into something, figure it out, and, uh, uh always try new things. Uh, is ask lots of even to your parents, even if they don't know a thing, because he can help you research it. Um, not saying my dad doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll let that slide. <laughs> um, yes. And uh, finally, it's all right if you make mistakes. As once you make mistakes, if you fall, you can get up and uh, learn from them. And, um, and finally, uh, have a passion for cybersecurity. Don't do it if you want to do it something else. Do it. Great. What about you, Weston? Do you have any advice you want to give to anybody out there who wants to uh, make sure that their computers aren't infected with a virus or whatever else that's nasty out there you want to deal with? Yeah, for, uh, as far as kids go, I would, especially if they're wanting to get into like ethical hacking or pen testing, uh, I would recommend that they learn the networking end of it and as, uh, like, get, not saying that uh, certifications will have a lot of clout, but like get the network plus type level or CCNA or ICMD one and two type information. Because when you're actually, you know, and like get a little bit of experience with being a sysadmin, because once you understand how those systems work, um, you can think what shortcuts people take and you'll be able to actually understanding the entire, you know, network layers and stuff like that. It's a lot of uh, information that'll help with a lot of that. And a lot of the misconfigurations or shortcuts that lazy <laughs> sysadmins or network admins take, that's something that I wish I would have gotten into networking a lot uh, when I was a lot younger. Because it's something where, yeah, I, I love computers, but it's like, you know, the whole networking aspect of it, that's like what, what my first job ended up being, aside from like doing server migrations. Like, because then you can bridge into actual security and you have a better understanding because everybody's just wanting to hop into cybersecurity right away. They're coming out of school with a cyber degree of some kind. And I would recommend taking the classical routes and definitely get some programming because uh, uh, exploits are getting a lot harder to actually come up with. Uh, a lot of the, uh, you know, the glory days of Windows XP and Server 2003, that was like, my primers, so it was like really, really easy. Like there was a, a volume being dropped weekly, you know, back in the day. So it's something where uh, you need to know your how to code pretty good, and a lot of that's you know, understanding how the actual exploits work is something that I would recommend. Uh, programming an hour a day, it doesn't need to be, you know, like I'm sure me, uh, like nine hour, you know, twelve hour programming binges. You don't need to do that. Literally, even if it's just re reviewing somebody else's code, I would just always be immersed in it. And it's amazing what after like two months of doing that. That's the biggest thing. Like we have uh, tons of people who have a lot of experience with, uh, you know, computers, and, and they can run the tools and stuff like that. But it, it's they don't understand how the tools work, and that's where the programming comes in. And technical writing is like one of the biggest things I'd recommend for people, because you know there, there's lots of people that are like brilliant programmers and hackers, but they write it in eighth grade level. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's like one of the biggest shortcomings because that's what the, if you're getting into pen testing, that's what the deliverables come into play. That's the final report. That's what the customer's paying for. And uh, just being able to write that, if you're doing it in a professional manner, it's something that your C-levels, if you're internal at a company, they're going to want the same kind of reporting, and they will appreciate that. Because 
most people they're either technical people or they're English majors, and it's you know it's very hard to get in between that and do some technical writing. So that's my biggest recommendation. There is a question from the internet. It's, uh, the, his name is the Bug, and he qu he questions you, Weston. Uh, do you know about the EU Commission plans to implement a directive that will essentially kill software-defined radio? Yeah, I was I was hearing. I have a bunch of German buddies, and uh, yeah, they were talking my ear off about it because I, I I can't remember where it's actually enacting, but I have not looked into or read enough of it to actually give a, a genuine interest in it. But it's something that yeah, definitely it scares me from what my uh, friend explained to me. You know, uh, we had a couple chat chat room sessions, but other than that, I haven't dived too deeply into it. I'm still recovering from uh, DEF CON a little bit. So. Okay. Uh, and Lisa, Lisa uh, also asks you, uh, if I turn off Wi-Fi on my MacBook Air, but I leave the computer powered up, is it still discoverable? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, I'm not a huge Mac guy either. So, but uh, as from what I've seen, um, I've got a couple companies where I've had to use Macs, I and I, 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 I personally own a Mac, but it's something where it, it does do. And there's certain uh, beacons, even if you tell it not to connect to it, it'll uh, treat those preferentially. And that's one of my yeah. biggest, uh, they make it too user friendly. You know what I mean? It's, it's something where, if, hey, I don't, I literally want my Wi Fi turned off. I'm in, you know, I'm at DEF CON at four at night. You know what I mean? You don't need your, you know, oh, it's, I'm, you haven't done your backup in a day. I'm going to automatically connect because that's what you want. I like having the physical control that you have with some of the Linux operating systems where it literally tells you, or it does what you tell it, not what. Uh, you assume it's doing so, but yeah, as far as the apples go, yeah, I, I do believe that they do power on whatever your backup time is, and that's something you, it's in a setting, but it's pretty well hidden. I can't speak for certain because I'm not a 100% Mac guy, but I do believe that that's uh, I the last I heard. Yeah, John, yeah, okay. So, uh, the Macintosh does a very, very good job of doing its very best to try to connect to the internet. Um, you know, it'll go out there, look for Wi Fi's, and uh, and it'll come up and it'll ask you give you a list of the Wi-Fi connections and ask you which one you want to connect to. And if, if you've already been connected to one of these Wi-Fi's before, uh, it'll, it, it will remember it and it'll just connect you to it. So, for instance, I can go here to the, uh, to the, the Lodi loft and then go back to my hostel and I never have to go set my Wi-Fi's at all. Now, obviously, you can turn your Wi-Fi off. And if you turn your Wi-Fi off and do not connect your Macintosh to any Ethernet c cable, and there's pretty good chance that your Macintosh is going to be safe, and no one's going to going to discover the Macintosh at that point. So just remember to switch off everything. Yeah, but there's some kind of energy settings where it'll actually do, it'll actually turn off, even if you're in, like, not airplane mode, but it's, like, um, silent mode, like, where you literally go to your air dock, and you'll turn it off, and it'll literally, uh, I have this exact same issue, because, uh, it, like, when it beacons, it looks for everything that it's, actually connected to in the past and that's like one of the biggest things i don't like i like having total control and yeah there's as far as yeah, if you're connected uh as long as it's not an impersonated beacon or bss id uh you should be pretty good so as long as it's like the uh, Oops. i'm not using anything that's open because those are easily broadcastable and connected to so you lost a little bit of your audio repeat the last 30 seconds oh yeah just anything that's open uh, is easier to impersonate as far as that goes, for, for, as far as uh, when people set up rogue access points. Um, yeah, but other than that, I would just want to connect to anything that's open. And uh, yeah, especially with, uh, yeah, especially depending on your environments. Like that's why I always bring like a burner laptop if I'm going to a security convention. So do we have any you might have question? to connect to airport oh, Sorry. Do we have <laughs> any questions here in the room? No questions in the room, actually. Internet is also silence. Do you have questions? I'm pretty out of questions at this point. pretty out of questions. Well, then I can't think of anything else I want to add. I Maybe mean, I have to think a little bit. Yeah. Is there something you like to... Uh, how, do, do, how do you want to, to finish this? <laughs> yeah, man. What if, for instance, uh, do you want, what do you want to ask the Captain Crunch here? I think we're pretty good. I think uh, I don't yes. really have any questions. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I think so too. Well, have a nice flight, Weston. Enjoy, enjoy the Netherlands. Uh, where are you going? Are you oh, yeah. trekked or are you going to uh, Amsterdam? I'm flying into Amsterdam, then I go to the Hanover. It's like uh, where the actual convention is. So mm, enjoy those hash coffee shops. Oh, well. 
I'll make sure to get some truffles for you, okay? So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, later, guys. Ruben, anything to 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 close up? You want uh, to yeah, say we, something? We, we, um, we just wanted to thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Oh, uh, thank uh -huh. you very much for being Just part. Think, yeah, thanks, thanks you all for being taken part for sure. We all appreciate it, especially here the people that, in the audience and That's and awesome. all those people on the net. <laughs> All those people out there in the stream uh, thing. Uh, what's the stream like? How many how many uh, viewers do we have here? Twenty people. Okay. Well, that's not bad. So have a nice evening to all and day and wherever you are. And yeah, I hope to see you next year. See you guys next year for sure. Take care, y'all. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. See you guys. Bye. 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 Have a nice day. Oh, I keep forgetting to do that. I see. If you don't, oh man, hold on. We did it. Yay. We are done. Wait a second.